Hi guys, so uh, I thought we'd do some um, real world games and I'm going to work through my thought process with you guys as we go. So I'm playing here, this is a 20 minute game, so this is rapid. I'm playing somebody who's rated just over 1000 and um, they've started with knight to c3. So I can go ahead, let's just play e5. So bringing out my king's pawn means that I've opened up my dark squared bishop and my queen. He's come back with uh, knight to f3, to, which attacks the pawn, not currently defended. So if I bring my knight out to c6, that should defend it. So we're going to be working on taking time. Uh, rule number one. Number two, king safety. Then rule number three, uh, dominating the board controlling the board. So I've got some options here. If I capture on d4, exchange pawns in the middle, then he would can recapture with his knight on f3 here. Then if I capture again, take his knight, then his queen will come out and take my knight. That would leave him with a knight um, developed and a queen in the middle of the board. That doesn't really do me any favours in particular, so I think I might be better off for example, playing f6, which will defend the pawn. And if he goes ahead and exchanges then, he is exchanging a his central pawn for my uh, pawn from uh, the, the wing, so to speak, on f, uh, f or c. So he's brought his queen out, maybe a little prematurely. The pawn here is defended. The knight is defended. That knight is defended. The queen isn't really attacking anything. So, um, however, one thing I notice is that he is now attacking the e5 pawn with two pieces, whereas it's only defended by one. So, one thing I could do, I could bring the bishop out, but that will then block off my uh, d pawn. I'd like to develop the d-pawn at some point to um, so that my light square bishop can get off the back rank. So maybe that's the best move, is just to push to d6. The pawn is then defending the, the um, e5 pawn. I think that's okay. So this queen's gonna look a little bit embarrassed now, I'm thinking. Okay, push to e4, that's, that's fair enough. What I can do now is bring my knight out to f6 and kick the queen away. I can't see any problem with that. You can see what I'm doing here when I, um, I'm going to move, make a move. I'm dragging the piece over and I'm not letting go. Okay, I'm going to hold it where I think I want it to go. And I'm just doing that sanity check okay, before I let go. Always worth doing. So let's have a drink. That's another good way to cause myself to slow down. I like doing that. I like to have my coffee in the morning. I sit in bed with the uh, with the iPad and play one or two games of, of rapid chess. Having the drink there sometimes gives me an excuse almost to take 30 seconds. It's absolutely fine. There's loads of time on the clock. I've got 17 minutes here. He's got 19 minutes. That's not a problem whatsoever. See, his queen has now just moved all the way back to her starting square. So let's look at the board now. I've got two pawns off the mark and two knights. He's got two knights and one pawn. So it's almost like I'm white now because I have the initiative of the game. He's given away that tempo, right? He's given away time because he's wasted a move, bringing his queen out and then moving it all the way back. So now what do we do? I would like to castle at some point. My um, dark squared bishop is now blocked off. In terms of controlling the board, there's really only a couple of um, squares that that bishop is, is even looking at right now, and that's not brilliant. Um, I can't really think about g6 and then moving the bishop to h6 because his dark squared bishop is on that diagonal, could, could just come straight down and uh, capture mine. So I think we'll probably sit tight with a with a uh, dark squared bishop for now. Uh, my light squared bishop 
is controlling this diagonal, which is fine. Um, so it could go, one idea is to put it to E6, where it's looking down on over here. But really, I'm thinking white's going to castle. All the pawns on the flanks are still in place. So right now, I haven't got any idea which side white's going to castle to. So one thought to, is to move the bishop out here to g4, which means that at least, at the very least, that, that knight on f3 is pinned. White could well try and kick my bishop away. Okay, so he's defended the knight and broken the pin. That's fine. Um, and kind of developed his uh, knight square bishop at the same time. Now, options. One idea is to move the knight in to d4. If he takes the my knight, I take his bishop. Knight catches. Uh, I haven't won that, really. Hang on, if, if knight goes, knight moves in, knight takes knight, bishop takes bishop, knight takes bishop, then I'm just a piece down. There's no there's no advantage to that whatsoever. What else could I do? Also thinking ideas about how to um, constrain white's ideas as well. So if you think about it, when we're talking about this kind of arm wrestle in the game um, of control of the board, how much of the board, how many squares do I control? How many squares does my opponent control? So actually limiting options for your opponent is just as advantageous as increasing options for yourself. So one thing I'm thinking about, it's got one minor piece still undeveloped. So you know where could this C1 bishop want to go? Uh, can't go here, might go to there or there, looking at my, well, obviously it can't go to h6 right now, but this is a possibility. So, you know, uh, pushing that pawn up to h6 is an idea. That's not too bad. It, it means I still have g5 is fine, and my forward bishop here still has the whole diagonal to go back to. I'm not too worried about that. White could move knight from uh, c3 to d5. That's not too threatening. If he does that, I can move the bishop back to e6 if I need to. So far, it's a, it's a fairly standard, fairly even, well-balanced game. My opponent is rated just over a 1,000, though, which generally means that he's quite likely at some point to make a blunder. Although this is a longer time format game, this is a 20 minute game with no increment. So sometimes when I think one important skill is when you're playing a game like this, it can sometimes just be a case of, you know, if, if there's nothing really emerging, if the game is well controlled, well managed, if it's quite tight, sometimes you just need to hold tight you just need to be cool don't rush don't panic and um, sit there and, and wait for your opponent to make the first mistake don't be pressured into making the first mistake yourself so let's use my so I'm now using his thinking time to do my thinking as well so I'm thinking what's he likely to do okay he's made his move he has developed his last minor piece, which is a good idea. He's not really attacking anything with it. He's brought it into the middle of the board. He hasn't got much play here on the king side. He can't move to f4 or to g5, and he can't capture on h6 either without losing his bishop. He also can't move there, or there, or there. So in terms of squares he controls, the bishop's looking at some squares, but it can't actually move to any of them. So what am I going to think about? At the moment, also consider my light squared bishop, this guy, is a good piece. 
And the reason why it's a good piece is because it can go to all these light squares. My, most of my pawns, apart from one, are on dark squares, which means that there's a lot of light squares available. So that bishop's uh, really, really mobile. My dark squared bishop, on the other hand, is not mobile. Because my, my pawns here are all on dark squares, my dark squared bishop is a worse piece because it has very few options. <coughs> so, given the opportunity in a game, I might be quite likely, quite happy, to um, exchange my dark squared bishop, say, for one of his knights, but I wouldn't be so keen to exchange my light squared bishop off the board, right? Because the the way that the pawn structure is, uh, my light squared bishop is a, a much stronger piece. So what I'm thinking about now is, um, I'm thinking I might castle queenside. I'd like to castle, I'd like to get my king safe. I'm not too worried about his bishops in the centre of the board, because they're not actually, when the bishops are in the centre like this, they're not attacking the back rank. So they're not attacking where my king is likely to be. They are attacking, right now, a7 and a6, which doesn't worry me too much. So I think castling that side makes sense. There's not too much of a threat. And the other thing is we've got a semi-open file on the D file here, okay? So there's no white pawn on that file. So if I can castle on that side, so let's move my queen to D7, right? Now I'm thinking of castling, and then my rook, after I castle, will be on D8 lined up with that queen. And that could be that could be advantageous. Oops, don't want to make a pre-move like that. That's that doesn't make any sense. <coughs> <coughs> right, White has now decided to kick my bishop away. Um, I don't think that's a an important move. I don't think it's a, it's a terribly useful move for him because by pushing that pawn forward, he's he's weakened G3. It means that G3 which did have two defenders, now only has one defender. So you really need to think about um, when you make a change to your pawn structure, the pawn is the only piece on the board that can't move backwards. Um, do it for a good reason. You, you need to have a good reason to move a pawn. Okay, so I've got a couple of ideas. <clears throat> Obviously that uh, f5 is out of the question. e6 is a possibility. But again, that's leaving my bishop a bit like his. Um, it's not actually in line with the back rank anywhere, it's just in the middle of the board. Another option is to move back to h5, which might prompt my opponent to play g4, further weakening his king side. So I think I'm going to go ahead and do that. If he plays g4, I can just bring my bishop back to uh, g6 here, where it's now, it will then be eyeing up this e4 pawn okay and we'll have then two attackers on that e4 pawn against only one defender so that's my that's my idea in fact should i go ahead and do that anyway i think maybe not similarly also because of my pawns being on the dark squares um, it means that his light square bishop is stronger than his dark square bishop Okay, his dark squared bishop, as we've seen, has almost nowhere to go. Right, so what he's just done is he's just exchanged his better bishop for my knight, which wasn't particularly well developed. It wasn't in a, a terribly strong place. Okay, so now he's just gone ahead and taken a pawn. And he's attacking my queen. Okay, this is one of those really good examples where, wow, suddenly you know, things got real. And um, see, it's more important than ever to take your time in a situation like this. Okay, so he's taken a pawn. He's a pawn up. My bishop, because the knight's moved, is now eyeing up his queen. His queen is on pre. My queen is also on pre. So I've got a couple of options. I can take his knight in which case his queen can come down and capture my bishop. I don't want that because that's a good bishop. All right? Also, I can't move the bishop because he will take my queen. So, what are my options? Do I have any checks? 
not that I can see. Okay, so I think that my only realistic move here. Um, actually, the queen cannot take that bishop because it's defended by a knight. So I can just go ahead and take that knight. I don't see any reason why I can't do that. Let's do it. His queen is now under attack, so he's got to do something about that. I also have two attackers on this pawn. Um, so, I have a thought, can I take that pawn with a knight? If I take that pawn with a knight, this pawn can't recapture because his queen will then be, uh, the pawn is pinned to the queen, so I can capture the queen. If I take with my knight, he takes with his knight, I take his knight with my queen, pawn takes, leaving an isolated pawn, I take the queen, no, I'm not very happy about that. I think a better move may be rook to d8, threatening the queen. If I do that, what's going to happen? So now I'm up on material, I don't have to rush, I've got seven minutes left in the game. He's got a lot more time. Um, another idea is to move the bishop out to pin the knight. If that pin the knight, then I can take the pawn on e4 freely. And I haven't lost my ability to castle. So I can't see anything wrong with that. His dark squared bishop is still useless. It can't really move forwards at all. Okay, let's do that move. He may be tempted to play g4 now. Okay. He's moved his bishop back. Now, in doing that, he's moved his bishop in front of his queen, which enables me to castle. So what that has now done is that moving the castling there and putting the rook on d8 means that his bishop is now pinned to the queen. So in the next move, I could go ahead if I wanted and capture that knight, which, and he'd then have to retake with a pawn, giving him doubled isolated pawns. That's two pawns that are not defended by each other, cannot defend each other, fairly useless. Another thing that it means, so I'm gonna go ahead and do that, he can't take with the bishop. He must take with a pawn. That also means that I can now go ahead and take this pawn with my knight, because if he then recaptures with his pawn, I can take the queen, which would win the game, basically. Okay? This is a guy, he's got 15 minutes on the clock. Right, why are you playing a 20 minute time control if you're going to take 10 seconds and blunder? Okay, so the queen is mine. He'll have to recapture with a rook. I can then, uh, I have a hanging pawn here on e4. Is there any good reason why I can't just go ahead and capture that? I can't see one. He can move a rook across, but then I can come back and capture the pawn on c2. And then I'm looking at the pawn on a2 as well. Um, if he moves the rook off d1, then that leaves his bishop hanging because of my rook here. Okay. That's a fairly non-threatening move, I don't think. I think I might just go in and take c2, threatening to capture the rook on d1. Um, the rook can't really move, because if it does, I can take the bishop. The rook has moved, so I can take the bishop. Don't want to, I don't want to take with the rook, because then he can put his rook to f8, um, exchange rooks, that doesn't really help me very much. I'll just take the bishop with a queen. So he, he can't now, yeah, that's, that's absolutely fine, I'm not worried about that at all. Um, he, he couldn't push his rook to f8, because then I take, he takes, I take. I means that I win that exchange. I have the initiative on, on the captures. So I'll just go ahead and hoover up this pawn. So I've used a bunch more time. I've used way more time than my opponent, but I've used it far better. Now, I need to be careful about king's safety. 
Okay, both of his rooks are pretty much open. They have a free pass to the back rank. I do not want my king to be trapped on the back rank. Um, so, one idea <clears throat> is to think about moving the king b8, a7, out of harm's way. I'm thinking about rook to d2, threatening to capture there, but then it's defended twice. So I think a, a, a sensible idea at this point in the game, I'm well ahead on material, um, is to get my king to safety. Like this pawn is now vulnerable because he can capture it with his rook. I cannot recapture with um, with my king. So what to do there? I think let's just move my rook across. Keep the pressure on. I have to keep an eye on the clock. I've only got four minutes left at this point. He's got a full 15. Okay, I'll just snatch that. There's no reason why not. <clears throat> He's got his rooks connected, which is very important for him at this point. Okay, that's a mistake. That, that would be very simple to calculate. Pawn on c7, okay. How many defenders? Queen, rook, and king, All right? So he's gone ahead and taken a pawn with a rook. I take the rook. And the reason I took with the king there is because towards the end game, it's a good idea to get your king into the towards the middle of the board, generally. Okay, uh, my opponent's just resigned on that one. So I think uh, definitely an instructive game. It started out in a very calm way. Okay. Um, and the important thing there was for me to stay calm because I could, you know, and then just to wait for my opponent to make an error. And surely enough, the frustration got to him before it got to me and he made an error. Okay, these are some, it's the little things like that. It's the temperament quite often that can just help you win games and get you over that, that 1000 uh, rating score. So I think that was, um, that's been <clears throat> pretty useful and instructive and uh, look out for the next one.